Welcome to our Research and Development Tax Credits webinar. KBKG was established in 1999. We have offices across the U.S., including Illinois, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Ohio, Georgia, New York, Texas, and Pasadena, California, where we are headquartered. We provide turnkey tax solutions to CPAs and businesses. Our engineers and tax experts have performed thousands of tax projects, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in benefits for our clients. Our team is a diverse mix of tax specialists, attorneys, engineers, and engineers from various disciplines. The combination of talent allows us to be the best at what we do and maximize results for our clients. KBKG is a preferred provider for thousands of CPAs across the country. Now I'm going to introduce our presenter, Michael Moroni. Michael is the Senior Manager with KBKG and advises clients on tax matters related to federal and state research and development tax incentives. He has 20 years of experience working on tax reviews, ranging from sophisticated multi-year claims to short-term consulting projects. He has advised numerous Fortune 500 clients across a variety of industries, including aerospace and defense, manufacturing, agriculture, pharmaceutical, communications, industrial products, consumer goods, software technology, and energy. I'd like to now turn the presentation over to our speaker. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is to first uh, walk you through the agenda that we're going to be covering on today's webinar. We're going to start with a brief legislative update, and next I'll, I'll discuss the R&D credit opportunity. Uh, then we're going to cover the tax definition of research and development activity. I'll explain the two federal calculation methods and walk through a couple of examples to show the mechanics. And then we'll wrap up by discussing uh, tax planning and audit strategies. Uh, finally, I'd like to encourage you to submit your questions in the chat box, and we'll, we'll do uh, our, our best, as Ellen mentioned, to answer as many of those as we can. So let's go ahead and get started. So the Section 41 credit for increasing research activities was originally acted in 1981, and at that time it was a temporary code section, and it stayed that way until it was permanently extended as part of the PATH Act of 2015. The Section 41 credit is a federal statute. However, most states offer some form of research credit that borrows from the federal statute. And although there are billions of dollars worth of research credit claims every year in the United States, there are still billions of dollars of credits that go unclaimed. This is primarily due to many taxpayers not being aware of the credit or not fully understanding uh, its use and its uh, applicability. This webinar will attempt to clarify some of the nuances of the R&D credit. So let's first talk about the uh, PATH Act and its effect on the R&D tax credit. It made three very important changes uh, to the R&D credit. First and foremost, the R&D credit has now been permanently extended, uh, allowing taxpayers that have traditionally taken uh, advantage of the credit uh, to continue to do so. So now it's, it's a, uh, a consistent, uh, reliable uh, credit that they can, they can rely on from year to year. The second big change is that the R&D credit can now be used to offset a portion of payroll taxes for qualified small businesses. And lastly, qualified businesses can now use the R&D credit to offset alternative minimum tax. So effective for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2015, Qualified small businesses can now use up to $250,000 of the R&D credit uh, to offset a portion of their payroll tax. Now, a qualified small business is defined as a person or entity with less than $5 million in gross receipts and no gross receipts before the five-year period ending with the current period. So, for example, if a taxpayer wanted to make the election in 2018, the taxpayer could not have had gross receipts prior to 2014. If the taxpayer had gross receipts in 2013, then this particular taxpayer could not make the election in 2018. 
And additionally, taxpayers cannot make the election for more than five years. Note that gross receipts are not required in order to make the election. Therefore, a company that has no gross receipts but does have a payroll tax and a research credit can make the election. Now, if a company is not a partnership or an S-Corp, uh, only the amount of the, the R&D credit carry forward can be applied to offset the payroll tax. The election will start the first quarter after the federal return is filed. So if a taxpayer files their 2018 tax return in March of 2019, the election will apply to payroll taxes beginning in the second quarter of 2019. So this is a prospective application of the credit against payroll tax. Startup companies in a multitude of industries are great candidates for the payroll tax offset. So for example, if you have a startup fintech, biotech, or software development company, uh, they should review their, uh, 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 those companies should review their potential as it pertains to the R&D credit. Generally, those types of startups are in a taxable loss position and, and therefore not generating a tax liability. Uh, whereas in the past, uh, those credits would have had to been, they, they could be claimed, but they could not be utilized uh, in that year that, that they had, that they were in a lost position. And now the credit can be used to offset uh, the payroll tax expense and generate a large cash benefit. So here's an example of how the payroll tax election can help a qualified small business. In this example, a software developer began operations in 2015. The company is comprised of 15 employees and did not receive any gross receipts until 2017. In 2018, the company had zero gross receipts, qualified wages of $2 million, resulting R&D credits of $200,000, and a payroll tax liability of $125,000. This company will file their 2018 tax return in March of 2019. Now, prior to the PATH Act, this taxpayer could have claimed the research credit, but will not have been able to use any of the credits until such time as they had taxable income. Due to the PATH Act though, they will be able to offset the qualified portion of their payroll tax in the second quarter of 2019. And then any unused credits will be carried forward to subsequent quarters. So the second uh, item uh, was the AMT reduction. So the AMT provision in the PATH Act is equally as valuable. Prior to the PATH Act, research credits could not be used to offset alternative minimum tax. Taxpayers that found themselves in AMT were forced to carry their credits forward until such time as they came out of AMT. Eligible small businesses, uh, which are defined as averaging less than $50 million in gross receipts the previous three years, can now use the credit to offset AMT for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2015. This provision is similar. Uh, many of you may remember the, 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 the small business provision that was enacted in 2010 as a result of the banking crisis. Uh, so, so this is very similar to that. One item to note is that the AMT reduction is not available to publicly traded companies. So here's a, a, an a R&D credit AMT example. So prior to the PATH Act, taxpayers had, that had an AMT liability could not use the R&D credit to offset taxable income. In this example, the taxpayer generated a research credit of $300,000. Their tax liability is comprised of $158,000 of regular tax and $23,000 of AMT liability, which totals $181,000 the taxpayer could not use any of their credits in 2015 and were forced to carry their entire R&D credit forward. But for tax years beginning in 2016, taxpayers in AMT are now able to use the research credits to offset their tax liability. In this example, the taxpayer generated 331,000 in R&D credits. Their tax liability is comprised of 188,000 of regular tax and 31,000 of AMT uh, results in 219,000 of total tax liability. So when we apply the Section 38 rules, as well as the new rules surrounding the PATH Act, 
Uh, it now allows the taxpayer to offset $178,250 of tax liabilities. Again, prior to the PAP Act, this taxpayer would have had to carry their entire R&D credit forward. But as a result of the new rules, this taxpayer will offset a large chunk of their tax liability and, be, and carry forward the excess credits. All right, so let's dig into what the R&D credit opportunity is. So the Section 41 credit is a general business credit. So as such, it provides a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in the, in, in the in taxpayer's income tax liability. Uh, so companies like pass-through entities, S, you know, S-corps and partnerships, they can also claim the credit. What happens there is that the benefit flows through to the individual shareholders on each shareholder's respective K-1. And then any unused credits can be carried back one year and then forward for up to 20 years. This chart uh, on your screen now represents the total amount of the federal R&D credits claimed since 2008. It's estimated that nearly $17 billion of R&D credits will be claimed by companies in 2018. And this chart represents the size of the businesses that are claiming the credit. 87% uh, of companies are claiming uh, that are claiming the credit have revenue in excess of $100 million. So that's the big R&D spend. Uh, while the, the uh, remaining 13% is split pretty evenly between companies with revenues less than $100 million and less than $10 million respectively. So one thing to remember with the federal credit is there's no cap on the amount of the credit at the federal level. So I would encourage you that if you have a client who can benefit from R&D credits, uh, make sure they're aware uh, with changes resulting from the PATH Act, we anticipate that the small and mid-sized companies are going to start claiming a larger share of this pie going forward. So now is a great time to, to revisit this with your clients. So the R&D credit, uh, the federal credit, offers roughly six and a half cents for every dollar spent on R&D activities. And for amended years, it's actually higher, closer to 10% uh, for every dollar spent on R&D, uh, qualified R&D. In addition to the federal credit, many states also offer R&D tax incentives as well, uh, mostly for R&D that takes place within the state. These are only a few examples on your screen. Uh, the methodologies vary. Uh, but most follow the federal calculation and the federal definition for uh, qualified research uh, and with slight variations on the, on the credit rates, the refundable nature of the credit, as well as any uh, carry forward and carry back provisions. So as of this year, these are the states uh, offering an R&D credit. Most of these offer a credit on the same qualified expenses claimed for the federal credit and may be claimed in addition to the federal credit. So if you or your clients are conducting R&D within any of these states, make sure you're looking into uh, claiming this for them. Arizona and Illinois, uh, I've got four states on here that are in bold print, uh, Arizona, Illinois, North Carolina, and Oregon. Arizona and Illinois both extended their credits through December 31st, 2021. Uh, Illinois' credit had expired uh, at the end of December of 2015, but later was retroactively in, uh, reinstated as of January 1st, 2016. North Carolina's credit is currently expired as of December 31st, 2015. So it, its R&D credit applies uh, only to open tax years 2015 or earlier. And then Oregon's credit is expired as of December 31st, 2017. So its R&D credit applies only to open tax years 2017 or earlier. Now, R&D credits can be found in, in several industries. I would I'd venture to say in almost every industry, uh, there is some qualified research being conducted that would qualify for the credit. Here's a list of just some of the industries where research uh, credits are, are most prevalent. Uh, basically, if your client is developing something new or uh, they are improving an existing product or process, regardless of the industry, they are conducting R&D activities eligible for the credit. 
Now, this slide shows the most popular industries whose companies are claiming the federal R&D credit. It's probably no surprise that manufacturing leads the pack, followed by software developers and engineering and scientific services. Uh, but if your clients fall with any of these industries, uh, there's, there's, there may be a great benefit here to, uh, for them. This slide uh, simply simply shows uh, real briefly some of the the, the more uh, interesting uh, study examples that we've uh, performed here at KBKG, and and I and I show this not to show us off, but but really to get you thinking about your clients and some of the activities that they may be involved in. If they fit into any of these examples, uh, then they they could be a really good candidate for the R and D credit. Um, so whether it's performing uh, f w uh, in formulations, for instance, so whether it's formulating new organic foods, spices, beer or wine, uh, experimenting with new ingredients and new processes or techniques qualify for the credit. And in the manufacturing space, whether it's designing and testing new prototype products or experimenting with new processing techniques in order to, to gain a competitive advantage, and those activities can qualify. In software development, whether it's developing software for back office applications, video games, mobile apps, uh, or computer animation, uh, those activities can qualify. Uh, if your client is a defense contractor and you think, well, the, the government's paying them or reimbursing them for their expenses, why, uh, why should they be able to claim a credit? Uh, well, they can. And so we, we just looked at the contract to make sure that they, they uh, retain substantial rights to the, to the development and, and have uh, a, a financial risk uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, delivering that product. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about contract research. If you have a pharmaceutical or someone, someone in, the, in the bio or life sciences space, uh, if it's a pharmaceutical company, for instance, developing drug formulations or, or conducting testing for humans uh, or animals, it can qualify. And finally, if, if the, in the mining industry, whether it's developing innovative extraction techniques or delivery processes or, or designing equipment uh, and processing machines for the industry, it can qualify as well. So next we're going to talk about what activities qualify and who can qualify uh, within, a, within a company uh, or, or, uh, or, or spending money outside the company in order to have research done on your behalf. So oftentimes when, when a reference is made to research and development, taxpayers uh, immediately think about uh, scientists in white lab coats, uh, mixing chemicals, or they might think of astrophysicists, uh, you know, working on, on, on the, the next generation of a, a long-range uh, telescope or something. But in reality, the R&D credit tests are much broader in application. And provided that we meet the following tests, we have an opportunity to claim the, the tax credit. So in order to in order for those activities to qualify the R for the R and D credit, there are four tests that have to be met, and these tests are applied at the business uh, component level. Uh, this has to do with um, the business component level is just a fancy way of of, of saying uh, that it, it's defined as kind of a product, a process, a technique, a software, or a formula. All right, so the first test that has to be met is, is called the technological in nature test. And what this means is that the project or the activities uh, associated with that project must fundamentally rely on the hard sciences. So that's, that's your physics, your, your physics, your biology, your computer science or engineering. The second test is that is the, called the permitted purpose test, and that has to do with the objective behind the research. The objective must be to either create something new to the taxpayer, it doesn't have to be new in the industry, just new to the taxpayer, or to improve, the intent has to be to improve the functionality, performance, reliability, or quality of an existing product or process. 
So once you've identified what your intended goals are, the third test is called the elimination of uncertainty test. At the outset of the project, there must be a degree of technical uncertainty related to the, uh, achieving the appropriate design of the business component or the capability or methodology for improving the business component. So in, the, in, in test number two is where you identify your, your, your goals that you're trying to achieve. And number three is what are the challenges associated with those goals? And then number four is a process of experimentation. So how do you eliminate the uncertainty? You experiment. And you experiment by, uh, by evaluating alternative uh, materials, alternative components, alternative designs, alternative ingredients if you're in, in, in beer or food formulations, uh, it, you're, 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 you have uh, different ingredients you're experimenting with. And, and that, uh, that, that is, to, is to help solve for the uncertainty and to achieve your goals in the permitted purpose test. So to the extent that a project or activity meets all four parts of this test, we are able to capture the expenses associated with the project towards the research credit. So generally, there are three types of expenses which qualify for the credit. And these are wages, supplies, and contract research. Qualified wages are generally defined as the qualified portion of an employee's W-2 box one amount for employees, uh, partnership earnings subject to self-employment tax, or Schedule C net profit, if it's a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC. Basically, what we're looking for is taxable wages here. Supplies. Uh, these are items that are used and consumed in the research process. So, for example, materials that are used in, in prototype components uh, can be uh, captured towards the credit. Supplies cannot be capital in nature. Therefore, you know, taxpayers cannot qualify land or machinery and equipment. And additionally, general and administrative expenses such as travel, meals, and meals and entertainment, and telephone expenses cannot be captured as part of the qualified supplies. And then third, contract research. And these are uh, these are defined basically as 65%, uh, 75%, or 100% of payments that are made to third parties for purposes of qualifying research. So if it's 65%, uh, if, if, it's, if it's paid to, uh, to non-employees, 75% uh, if it's paid for uh, a certain uh, research consortia, or 100% if it's uh, for uh, eligible small businesses, universities, or federal laboratories. So now that we know what qualifies, it's important to understand who qualifies. There are three levels of qualifying activities for employees. The primary level would be the individuals that are engaged in the qualified research. These are the individuals who are working directly on the project. So from there, the taxpayers, uh, taxpayers can capture one level directly above and one level directly below the qualified research. So one level above would be the individuals who are directly supervising the, uh, the, the, the qualified activity being conducted by their subordinates. And then one level below would be the individuals that are directly supporting the personnel. One thing to note about direct supervision and direct support is that they need not meet the four-part test, but the activity that they are directly supervising or directly supporting does need to meet the four-part test. So down, uh, on, further down on the slide, where it talks about outside contract service providers. So generally, any payments that are made to third parties for the, con the, the conduct of research on your behalf are eligible to generate research credits. So it's important to note payments for contract research are subject to a statutory reduction. And we talked about this, it's 35% for, uh, for non-employees, but depending on what type of, of 
the research being conducted or, or who's conducting that research, it could go as high as 100%. So here are a couple of examples of each for direct supervision. Uh, so direct supervision could include first-line supervision of direct research activity. Um, oftentimes you'll have a, a, an engineering uh, uh, direct, a director of engineering or a VP of engineering reviewing technical designs or even communicating those uh, customer requirements to his engineering team. Uh, those are direct supervision activities. There's also direct support activities. So it could include an admin, uh, administrative assistant, documenting uh, test results on the in the engineering group. Uh, it could be a janitor uh, maintaining and cleaning research equipment in between, uh, in between trial runs or in between experiments. It could be uh, compiling research data for a process improvement or, or creating experimental models. So the determining, the determining uh, factor uh, for qualification is the nature of the activity to which the expenditure relates. So qualified activities are applied at the business component level. Qualified research activity is defined by the four-part test that we just uh, went over. But there is something called the shrink back rule. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to qualify the project as a whole so, far, so long as that project represents at least 80% of, of qualified activity defined by the four-part test. So for instance, if, if, you're, if you're creating a, a new product and the components of that product, uh, greater than 80% of the cost of developing that prototype represents new or improved uh, uh, features, functionality, performance, uh, then you can capture the entire cost of that prototype, even the non-qualified cost, uh, because it's less than the non-qualified is less than 20% of the total. Uh, but if that business component, maybe there's two out of three of those components that uh, are new or improved, but the third one isn't. It's a, it's a simple integration of the three components together. Then what you're required to do is to shrink back your focus to just the two components that do meet that that uh, the four-part test. Does that make uh, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, some qualified activities. So examples of, of, of activities fall under several categories, and and this list here is certainly not all inclusive. But but some of the things that do qualify are design stages of a product or project, including the specification design, technical design work, CAD design work, modeling and analysis and simulation. Also, any prototype development, and that, can, uh, that, that ranges from the design of the prototype to the construction and to the testing of that prototype. And then any testing and experimentation, including computer modeling and simulation, prototype testing, and even field tests uh, when, when a product is installed at a client or a customer site uh, doing the testing to make sure everything is functioning as it is intended. And it's important to note that success is not required in order for the project to qualify. In fact, when a development is unsuccessful from a technical perspective, it makes the, uh, the technical uncertainties associated with that project that much more obvious. So we covered some qualified activity. Let's talk about some non-qualified activity. So non-qualified activities include any activities that take place outside of the United States or its territories. Additional examples include uh, adapting, uh, adaptation of an existing business component. What that is, that's, that's changing the, uh, making a minor modification to an existing product and calling it R&D. Duplication of an existing business component. Once you've created a prototype and validated it, if you are creating, you know, three more of the same prototype, that's not really R&D because you're just duplicating what already exists. Reverse engineering would also fall within that uh, category. 
the social sciences, any, any activities around the social or soft sciences, arts or humanities does not qualify. And then studies that uh, related to, uh, to efficiencies, uh, management operations, or profitability uh, do not qualify. Routine data collection, if you're running a production line, for instance, and you're, you're just collecting data on the production units going through the, 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 the line, it might be that down the road you're going to use that data to uh, institute some kind of a process improvement initiative, but the, the, the routine data collection as it's going through does not, you can't just have a, a, a process engineer down there uh, qualifying at 100% because he's watching uh, production units go through the line. And then routine or ordered ordinary QA testing. Uh, where, where we see qualified QA happening is, is, is on the prototype prior to validating the design. So once it's been validated, it's ready for commercial production and it's released into commercial production and it's being produced, it will be happening after that point where it's just routine picking up every you know, 5,000th unit off the, off the line and, and, and taking some measurements to make sure that it's still within spec is not R&D. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, funded research. This is actually a really important um, and very common uh, area within within R and D, uh, and it's very misunderstood. Uh, so, so let's say that your 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 client is uh, develops a product, and they are uh, they're selling that 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 product. You know, you might say, well, wait a minute, aren't they being reimbursed for that product? I mean, they 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 put in the effort to it. They, the, the cost, and then they, they priced that out, and they, and they, and they sold it. Um, same way with a prototype. If you, if, you're, if you create a prototype, and then you end up selling that prototype, isn't that funded research? And uh, the answer is no. Uh, it's not funded research. What, 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 where we look when we talk about funded research is that the t uh, Let's back up just just a second. The taxpayer, in order to claim the R and D credit, uh, they must retain at least shared rights to the technology that's under development, and the taxpayer must also be deemed at risk financially for that development. So, funded research only really applies when you've got a uh, a contract in place. So, if you have a uh, if you have a client who who, who, who develops custom product for their clients and they enter into a contract to create this design for that, for that client, uh, there can't be any restrictions placed by the customer on your client on how that uh, design can be used. In other words, if, they want, if, if your client wants to take that same design, make stuff for, for you know, their competitors, uh, based off that design, so long as the contract does not uh, exclude or, or prevent them from doing so, then they are then they're okay and they can claim the, the credit uh, on those costs. The other thing is is that at, they need to be at risk financially, and what that is defined as is is your your clients your clients customer. If they're, if they're paying your client to develop something for them, then your client only gets paid when they are successful. So they're not just paid for their time, they are paid for a successful solution. And that's what puts your client at risk financially in order to meet that test. So it's a very important, uh, you know, if it's all internally, if it's all internal R&D that your client is, is doing on their own dime, that's one thing. But if they enter into a contract to develop something for somebody else, or if they enter into a contract with a third party uh, to do research on their behalf, then you've got to look at the contract and see, make sure that they're, they retain risk and rights in that development. I alluded to the fact that once a prototype reaches commercial production, that the R&D activities end on that prototype. So here are uh, some other uh, non-qualified activities that occur after commercial production. So any pre-production planning, pre-production tooling, trial production runs, 
troubleshooting production equipment, uh, accumulating data related to production, and any debugging uh, activities uh, after commercial production will not qualify. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the two calculation methods for federal, and we'll run through a couple of examples. So the credit is the sum of 20% of the company's QREs over a base amount, plus 20% of basic research payments. And these are payments that are made to tax-exempt organizations performing research on your behalf. So think in terms of universities, scientific research organizations, and the like plus 20% of payments made to energy research consortia. These are tax-exempt organizations performing energy research, and they're typically funded by a small group of taxpayers with a vested interest in the results of that research. The credit is based on the qualifying activities that are conducted by the company or those performing research on the company's behalf. Now, this is primarily a wage-based credit. And the U.S. Treasury reports that on average 70% or 75% of the credit is generated from employee wages. It's also incremental in nature. In other words, we, you, get, you, get, uh, you get more of a credit the more that your current year QREs uh, exceed a base amount. Now, we'll discuss the, R, the, uh, the alternative simplified credit method later, later in the presentation. And that has helped somewhat for companies experiencing uh, relatively flat or even slightly decreasing R&D every year. So these are the two federal credit calculation methods available, uh, the regular credit and the alternative simplified credit. Both methods require calculating a base amount, which a company's current R&D spending must exceed in order to claim the credit. For the regular credit, this base period focuses on years 1984, 1988. And alternatively, if the company was not around during that time or they weren't performing R&D during those years, then the base period shifts to activity occurring after 1993. Now for the ASC, the, the base amount involves only the three prior year's expenses. Taxpayers may elect on an originally filed return which method it wants to follow. But once made, the company is stuck with that election for that tax year. So if a taxpayer wants to change its calculation method on a future tax year, it can be done on that year's original return. But when amending a prior year return in order to claim the R&D credit for the first time, either method may be used. There are four items necessary to calculate the regular credit. And that's, we don't see this credit used a whole lot outside of maybe a startup uh, company. And, and, this, and you'll see why in a minute. It's just a lot of information to go through. Uh, one is you need your qualified research expenses. The second item you need is average annual gross receipts for the four prior years. Then you need to calculate what's called a fixed base percentage. This is defined as the ratio of aggregate QREs over aggregate gross receipts for a specific period of time. And the maximum fixed base percentage allowed is 16%. Then the last thing you do is determine the base amount. And to do this, you have to compare two numbers or two calculations. First, you multiply your average annual gross receipts by your fixed base percentage. And then what you do is you take 50% of your current year uh, QREs, or qualified research expenses. Whichever is greater becomes your base amount, and this is the amount that your current year QREs must exceed in order to get a credit. The credit rate then is applied to this amount to arrive at your, at your credit. So this is an illustration of, of a fixed base percentage calculation. This assumes a base period in the years 84 to 88. This means that the company was conducting R&D in at least three of the five years during this time period. So to calculate the fixed base percentage, we total up the QREs for these five years and divide by the total gross receipts for the same period. Now for members of a controlled group, QREs, are, are, uh, QREs and gross receipts uh, for each member must be included in the calculation. So in our example, the fixed base percentage is 2.3%. So
So here we have an example of a regular credit calculation. So in this example, we have a company with a current year R&D spend of $3 million. The average annual gross receipts for the four prior years is $75 million. We next compare the tentative base amount to the minimum base amount. The tentative base amount is $1.7 million. And that is calculated by taking the $75 million in gross receipts multiplied by the fixed base percentage of 2.3%. When we compare this to the minimum base amount, which is 50% of the current year uh, R&D spend of $3 million, we see that the tentative base amount is larger. Therefore, we use that as our base amount. When we subtract the base amount from our current year R&D spend, that yields an incremental R&D uh, spend of 1.2 million. We then multiply this by the 20% credit rate to get the gross R&D credit, and then again by 79% if the 280C reduced credit is elected. Now, I'll make a, a, a point here with regards to the 280C. I said 79%. A lot of you familiar with the R&D credit would say, well, why isn't it 65%? I thought it was for the, for the reduced credit. We take a haircut of 35%. Well, that's to reflect the new uh, maximum corporate tax rate of 21%. And so now we only have to take a, a haircut on an original return uh, of 21%. Now, why do we have to take a haircut at, at, at all? Well, the reason is, is that the gross credit, uh, when it's claimed, if you don't take the 280C, then, then what you have to do is you have to add that, the amount of the credit back to income. And the uh, the gross credit, uh, on an amended return, there is no option for electing a reduced credit uh, on an amended return. So in, in, in those instances, you do have to add the full amount of the credit back to income. So it just makes the 280C reduced credit just allows uh, on an original return for you to not make any adjustments to your deductible expenses or not add that back to income, but you are taking a 21% reduction. Uh, in the credit amount. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the alternative simplified credit. So the uh, alternative simplified credit is calculated by applying a 14% credit rate to the current year QREs that exceed a base amount. The base amount is the prior three tax periods. So as such, a major benefit to the using the ASC is that it requires much less historical documentation. Uh, the ASC is a great option for older companies, which may not have records to support their base period under the regular credit method. And furthermore, companies with large gross receipts um, and also those that uh, are, are complex uh, with a lot, of, a lot of subsidiaries, large organizations, uh, they, they also can benefit from use of the ASC. Again, with, the, with ASC, there's only two items that you need. Uh, one is your uh, current year QREs, wages, supplies, and contractors, and, uh, and for, the th for the three prior years as well. And then you calculate your base amount. And that's 50% of your average QREs for the three prior years. So here's an ASC example. In this example, we have a company with 3 million of QREs. Base amount is 1.1 million. That leaves current year QREs available of 1.8, 1.9 million. We apply the 14% credit rate and get an alternative uh, simplified credit of 262,500. If we elect the 280C reduced credit uh, in, a, in an amended year, it's going to be 65%. But again, in 2018, beginning in 2018, uh, that uh, reduction is uh, only, it's 79%. Uh, and so you're able to, to, to get more, keep more of that, uh, of that money due to the lower corporate tax rate. So in the interest of time, uh, you have it in your slides, I would encourage you to download this presentation and look at some of these uh, industry examples. Uh, but it's just showing, uh, uh, you know, what, what, the, what an average company's you know, gross receipts are, the wage expense, qualified wages, and the potential federal credit associated with those. So I'm going to just skip through these. There's one for manufacturing. 
All right, so there, there are some tax planning uh, things that we've discussed here. One is whether to elect 280C on a timely filed return or not. So you will have to look in, at your 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 uh, your client's tax position, and if 20 if their uh, if their uh, if their tax rate is is less than uh, the uh, the 21 percent, then it may not make sense to uh, to elect 280C on the original return. Uh, also, if they are in losses, as I mentioned before, you can go back to a closed tax year uh, where they experienced a loss. And if they were doing qualified research, claim an R&D credit, and then adjust the loss carry forward uh, based on apl applying the, uh, the credit amount to that year. And then we already talked about, uh, about uh, AMT beginning in 2016 for eligible small businesses. And there is no more corporate AMT uh, beginning in 2018. Some IRS audit considerations I want to leave you with is that there is an audit technique guide uh, out there. Treasury published it. It's publicly available. It focuses on the areas that are commonly looked at under audit. Um, and so the, the second item here that I want to look at is that IRS continues to target the use of estimates. Even though the courts have ruled time and again that, that credible estimates may be used to determine not only the qualified expenses in the current year, but also in the base years as well. Also, oral testimony, again, so long as it's credible oral testimony, may be relied upon to determine qualified activities surrounding its business components. And then finally, documentation. Uh, we're, seeing that, uh, we're, we're seeing that more uh, in in uh, in R and D audits uh, over the past ten years or so, uh, that that the, the supporting contemporaneous documentation is expected uh, under audit. Uh, that, that, that you'll be able to prove through contemporaneous documents that you are conducting uh, R and D, and and that, uh, that there's a nexus between the documents that you're providing and the activities and the expenses that you're claiming. So with that, this is a list of, uh, it's not an all-inclusive list, but just a list of some of the uh, documents that, that we will typically ask for uh, to help support the, the story that there is R&D taking place. And so we can look at functional requirements, project schedules, business cases, architecture documents, PowerPoint presentations, proposals, uh, lab notebooks. Uh, data sheets, emails. Don't forget emails. Emails have a, a wealth of information in them. That's how we communicate uh, our uncertainties back to our boss. You know, how how's the provide a project status update? Okay, and you look through an email, and uh, there's all the reasons why the project has been uh, is behind or or over budget. Uh, 